Hey, builders. Welcome to AOO Build. It's Ethan Alter from Yahoo Entertainment, and I'm here chatting with Angela Serafian from Westworld. Season 2 airs on HBO Sunday nights at 9 p.m., and as fans know, it's been a big season full of multiple storylines, killer robots, and an amazing Rickroll. We're going to talk with Angela about all of that, but first let's watch a clip uh, from this past season. Robert, how are you alive? Well, you've seen the company's little undertaking, Bernard. Do you think James Delos would have spent all that money just to resurrect himself? He was a businessman. He would have preferred death to a bad investment. Not much of a rant, aren't you? I'll give you a discount. He's not a prospect, Clementine. Can't you tell when a man's just here to gawk at the merchandise? Awesome. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, Angela. Obviously, it's great seeing Clementine 1.0, I think, in that scene from this past week's episode. It's been so long since we've, see, since we've seen her, I feel. It was great to see her back in action that yeah, way. Yeah, it was great to film that scene. It was kind of uh, emotional to go back into the, the Mariposa and play what Clementine was first, you know. And I loved it. I, I remember kind of choking up when Tandy and I walked in there. Uh, because we haven't worked together this entire season, so it was really special. Right, right. And we should remind people for uh, fans who maybe are forgetting from season one, although that's hard to believe that anyone would forget what happened in season one. Uh, Clementine uh, and uh, Maeve were two of the, uh, the the hostesses in the saloon. They were best uh, best buds, you could say, best friends. And then uh, Clementine suffered a tragedy at the end of the season. And we weren't sure at that point whether she'd be back or not, or, or whether you'd be back or not. Did, you, did they leave you in limbo uh, about when you be returning for season two well you never know um i i remember we were shooting the very last day of episode 10 in season one and um i had to, i got this opportunity to, sh to shoot at harris in the shoulder and i thought wow that's that's something <laughs> there's something waiting for clementine in season two so i was hopeful right <laughs> And when you knew you were coming back, but not quite in the same way, how did that feel, knowing that you wouldn't be classic Clementine or, or original OG Clementine, whatever you want to call it? I, I was excited about that because I thought this is a really great opportunity to maybe get to be a badass, like beat some people up and sh shoot people. I should probably not say that, but... <laughs> But, I mean, Clementine would really enjoy that, and I love to do that stuff. So I, I was really looking forward to doing that, and I was hoping, I was really hoping that I could play old Clementine, and I did, so, so that was special. <laughs> No, I mean, it, it makes sense that, uh, that uh, after the way you have uh, exited the first time in that really brutal action sequence where we sort of see Clementine uh, first uh, 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 beat up and then she dishes out the punishment after that, that gave a hint of the kind of punishment she could deal uh, if, oh if, if left I unchecked. loved shooting that scene. That was one of my favorite scenes to shoot of season one. And I, I just thought, what an awesome opportunity for someone who seems as though they might be a victim to then turn around and kick someone's ass like that that was that was cool <laughs> so walk us through your favorite mo move in that sequence like the the, the 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 bit of action that you enjoyed the most uh dishing out brutality oh um so when when she's initially sitting there she's just sitting there i'm not gonna act it out but when she's sitting oh, come there on. i'm sure we get a willing volunteer to <laughs> okay. do you want no i'm kidding yeah um uh i, I thought it's really exciting because she's approaching with her her loop, and I walked up to him and I, it was like a dance. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, you're going to do something insane and it's really consequential. And I think it's the most touching when it's, um, when it breaks a person. The way that he was hitting Clementine was like uh, someone beating someone up and but not in a martial arts kind of cool way. Mm -hmm. It was more like it was something scary. So then when she turns around, I thought she was like an animal, like she was a lion and she attacks him and you really see what the host's strengths are. That is the very first time I think you really see what they could do because she's so dainty and you would never assume it. And it's so easy for her to break someone's skull 
I hope you guys laughed at that. <laughs> I have a really dry sense of humor. <laughs> Again, I think they're hoping for a demonstration. Like, but we, but we, but we'll, <laughs> I don't. We'll I, I deliver up. everything very dry, and a lot of the time, people don't think it's funny, and it's meant to be funny. <laughs> That plays nicely to a show like Westworld, though, where you do have to sort of have this, uh, it, what you're saying is not always what you're feeling. The, the hosts don't always have the, the, their own emotions to control, in a sense. Right, right. And I think that's what's special about season two, right. is that she's no longer playing a part that's given to her. Actually, it's really tragic because of the lobotomy. It, it's, it's kind of like what you once were has now been completely obliterated, and you have to function from a place that is half dead, but you still can see and you still can feel and you still can want to speak and can't. And so I thought that was really interesting to look at and see if there was room at any point to bring out just wanting to live again, just a little bit. So I, I love that scene between the new Clementine and, and the Mariposa. I thought, oh my God, she's seeing a ghost of herself. Oh, it's so tragic, but very relatable, I think, very human. In your head, uh, she, she had her mind wiped at the end of season one. It was given a kind of robot lobotomy, essentially. Do you think, do you, in your, as you play her, do you still think of her as Clementine? Is she still Clementine? Yes, absolutely. Mm. I, absolutely. I think, I think she is Clementine, and not the Clementine that's only in the Mariposa, but they are, they are almost Shakespearean, these characters. They're not, you know, it's my acting teacher, uh, his name is Tony Greco. He was always talking about what is unique about Shakespearean characters. You would think if it's Juliet that she's not smart or she's not uh, scholarly, but she actually is, even, even if she is a 16-year-old. And that's the same thing for Clementine. I think that this character was quite... Um, wise and vulnerable and strong and she isn't just what is given to her what part has been given to her at the mo at this very moment right, right. yeah well, one of the striking things about seeing uh, original clementine again in that clip is hearing you speak again because clementine this season has has had barely a word of dialogue which is a very different uh, experience to play i imagine not having the comfort of dialogue to fall back on in a lot yes. of scenes yes it's very different and you know what i i I was thinking about this. If you see the old westerns, if you guys, I don't know if you have seen it, but if you've seen like the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. or if you look at Once Upon a Time in the West, right. they have these insane moments where nobody is talking and they're just kind of, you see someone's eyes and the other person's eyes and it's just tension that builds. And then they're gonna do something, someone's gonna die, there's consequences. So that's what I got to explore with this season. Mm -hmm. I really thought that was an interesting thing to explore and to use my body in a in a way of telling a story, um, so so I I I got to do that and uh, I've said this before, but I think Marlon Brando said that the falsest thing an actor or a person can do is say a word. That's the falsest thing. So if I could solve the problem without a word, without saying anything at all, and and still reach what I want, then that's what should happen. And so I thought. That's that's the approach this season for me. Right, Be because um, you don't have dialogue this season to communicate who Clementine has become. How did you physically approach the role? How does her physicality differ this season than than season one? Well, um, in season one, she's uh, uh, it's season one. Clementine is a sensual creature. She is, I think, someone that really celebrates her femininity, and I thought that was a beautiful thing. For me personally, I always thought. I'm smart, I've got a brain, I, I wanna achieve things not based on what I look like and not based on being a, a woman, mm -hmm. but rather what can I create, what can I do? Just like another man would, any man would, any woman, we are the same. But actually, I think the benefit in being a woman is that it's, it's a part of you and it's, it's good to celebrate that. And so that's what she taught me in season one, that celebration of, yes, I've got hips and an ass and boobs, and it's great. <laughs> and, and I love it. And I get to wear beautiful dresses, pink dress, high heels, make my hair. It's good. It's not a bad thing. That makes you a feminist in a way because you are feminine. So in season two, that's all stripped away, but still at the heart of it, she's a woman, right. a strong woman. And I was using 
I don't know if this is interesting for you guys to hear, but ballet, you know, I right, thought... Right, ballet training, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, you train somebody. And I was thinking about, um, actually, Swan Lake. Mm. And I was thinking about Carmen is another ballet. Right. And I was looking at this very specific ballerina. Her name is Maya Plisetskaya. She was uh, a dancer at the Bolshoi Ballet years ago. This mm. is during the communist era. And the way she carries herself, like, as Carmen, and then when she's going to go kill someone, I just thought, oh, my God, that's, there's something in that. There's something about pulling a guy and using no effort at all, seeming like you're just floating in the air. Right. So I thought that was something interesting to play with. Yeah. No, I mean, it's just, I, mean I think people don't always know how, what, what, how exactly um, ballet can function. People, like, we, we often hear about movements being balletic or, or uh, action being but seeming balletic. But as an actor and, and with someone who's training in ballet, you actually can speak to what those movements mean in a really yes. real way. Yeah. And it's, it's in a, telling a story through movement. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> just pet it gently. <laughs> just pet it gently. Are you okay? He's just a little upset, you know. Right. You you, you mentioned that when you and uh, Tandy Newton got on the set uh, for uh, uh, for that clip again after not working together all season, you, yeah. you you teared up a little bit. So working with Evan instead, Evan Rachel Wood, who plays yes. Dolores on the show, you've had a lot of scenes with her this season. Yeah. What has that experience been like working? Oh, with her? I love working with Evan. I think she's an she's an incredible actress, and I loved what she did this last episode. Did you guys see? I thought she was so scary. And the, the scene between her and, Sh and Charlotte Hale and her father, Peter Abernathy, it was very moving. And I, I found that she's in a very generous actress. Mm -hmm. Even when the camera isn't on her, she's there with you. And I, I really appreciated that. And so we were supporting each other throughout. I was supporting her. Clementine was supporting Dolores. It was all kind of wonderful. Right. I had such a great time. <laughs> You had a preseason moment with uh, Evan. I think that everyone fans know there was a oh, yeah. Rickroll video that went out uh, that was under the guise of seeming like a real Westworld spoiler video. And then you watch two minutes of it, and suddenly it's you and Evan duetting on uh, the yeah, that was, classic. That was, that was amazing. <laughs> I love doing that. that was when so was that funny. pitch to you? How, how, how did that come about? So I was going to go do some uh, behind-the-scenes stuff for, for Westworld, and she was too. And so Jonah had this idea the night before and emailed saying, hey, you know, if it's not too much trouble, would you mind, would you be into doing this? And I said, yes, of course. <laughs> and so I found the notes because I play piano and learned them that night. So when you watch the clip, I look like a, a robot like, like that. And I'm actually focusing on the notes because I hadn't memorized it. It's hard to do that right away. I can't do it anyway. But so, so it was really fun to do, to do that. It was really, it was cool. And Evan just sang in the moment. Like, she had not ever, you, what you see is her singing for the first time. And I was just like, what the, that, she's singing so beautifully. She has a great voice. Have you heard from Rick Astley? Has he reached out to congratulate you? No, he hasn't. <laughs> Has he? No. I wish you get the, I wish he'd reach out now. Where is he? Yeah, I know, right. And here he is right now. He's coming he in. Oh, and, and there he is. And no, nope, there's nobody there. I, at least now you have a, a go-to karaoke song whenever you whenever it's. Oh my god! You, you, you guys never want to hear me done. sing. My mom tells me it's not a gift that you have. <laughs> <laughs> you can do a lot of things, but not sing, and that's the truth. Sometimes it's having uh, nice having. Uh, good I once auditioned for once the Broadway musical. Right. Oh my gosh! I shouldn't tell you guys this. No, please do. Now, so now I could just... play the piano, right? I learn the piece. They're shoot. They're doing this audition in L.A. I go in, and I start playing, and it's beautiful. The casting director, producers, is like, "Wow, wow, wow!" Like, I could see it. I could feel it in their eyes. And then I start to sing, and they go, "Like, oh my god!" <laughs> and. And I, I realized I stand up from the piano because I was like now at this point trying to hide as I'm singing. I stand up and I look at them and I say, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and from that day, I will never, ever audition for, for a musical. Don't consider me for a musical ever. Although I really want to do one. Just forget Wait. what I just said. <laughs> She's available for musicals, just, yes. you know, very specific And I musicals. could dance. <laughs> yeah. Right, there we go. Yeah.
<laughs> the uh, what you said earlier about sort of um, uh, Clementine uh, being at the forefront of the action this season. It's all the women are really this season as the robots are leading the rebellion. It's led by Maeve, by Dolores, by Clementine, and obviously Clementine you, supporting Dolores. Right, exactly. Clementine su- supporting Dolores, but it, but it, obviously you couldn't have known this when you were making the show. But it's appropriate for the uh, what's happening right now in terms of the Me Too and Times Up movement about yeah. seeing women at the forefront of these uh, efforts to reclaim uh, their lives essentially. And and, and, and who they can be. And I think that's what's so interesting about this show is that they're not, they're so timely. Mm-hmm. The show hits so many things on, I almost think it's like a serendipitous level. It's not, oh, what's happening in the world now? It just does it because it's the right thing to do. And um, I'm very, very k- proud of everything that with the Me Too movement and and Time's Up. And, and so... Um, to tell a story through a woman's point of view, to find a woman that is not only the lead, but also strong and fighting for something that they want is incredibly unique. So more and more stuff for women, because we're good. We're so good. <laughs> Write more movies for us, please. Do you know how much of an influence, I mean, working with both Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, do you get to see how Lisa, what what perspective Lisa brings to it that maybe uh, Jonathan wouldn't do on his own? Have you worked with her one-on-one in terms of how to craft I have an interesting story to tell you. So she she directed episode four of this season, which I think is probably the best episode. Um, And I'll tell you why. I was on set. uh, We were shooting that part where Bernard arrives near the cave. And she did this interesting thing with the camera where she was trying to tell the story with one camera movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, if you're you're working on a TV show, they do this shot, they cover that person, they do this, the wide angle, this angle. And she was saying, well, what if when he comes out of the cave, the camera follows him, and then as it turns from him, it goes to Shannon, Elsie's character, and as it turns back, he's gone. And then it turns back again, and Mm -hmm. she's confused, and then it turns back, and there he is again. And I thought... Oh my God, oh my God, she is, this is gonna be special. I knew from just that single thing that she did. And so when I saw the episode, you really, I think it's, it reminds me of like Stanley Kubrick Mm. because you see the white and the blood dripping and the way that she uses color. And, And so I thought it was so, so great, like to tell the story through color, through sound, through through the single shot movements with the camera. And so um, I don't know what that woman can't do. Like, so, it's, so I, I think she's a unique person. And I think Jonah brings a very different part. And there is this grandness to him, like, that gives you goosebumps. You're like, oh my God, what are we going into? It's Inception, it's like interstellar. And and talking about these very existential things mm-hmm. is so important, I think. I, I'm a geek about that stuff. <laughs> No, I mean they, they've all, they, all a lot of the Nolan's work have, has obviously owed a lot to Kubrick in a lot of time. So you can see the the influence of that and other uh, uh, films on their work, and sure. they wear their influences on their. I screen. mean, that's my really hum- that's my humble opinion. Right. I, I, you know, I'm I'm a film nerd, so I I, I know them, but I, it's not to say that that's what it is. I right. just I just yeah, that's what I saw. Right. So film nerd question, obviously. Then, what's your favorite Kub- Kubrick movie? If you had to pick one. Oh, oh, A Clockwork Orange. Oh. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I really think it's interesting because it's also very psychological, and it's oh, and The Shining. I mean, there's so many. I like them all. <laughs> yeah, those two are the ones that are popping out of my head. Right. My brother's in the audience, and what was the other one that he, the 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 movie about the soldiers, Full Metal Jacket. Ah. Sorry, that's embarrassing that I didn't know the name, but that's <laughs> love Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I could see you doing the Arlie Ermey part sometime as as, as the oh, drill sergeant. You? That he, oh, yeah. really? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think, I think if, if they ever remake it, I think I think that, that that's the part be, that yeah, I should exactly. play. Exactly. Go for it. I don't know why I had a vision of Apocalypse Now. Maybe it was <laughs> Full Metal Jacket, but. Yeah. Well, in the most recent, at the end of the most recent episode, we see uh, Clementine go down and what looks uh, in a hail of gunfire, and we don't know what's com- what's coming next, obviously. But uh, uh, the uh, having to play another death scene, how, how would you compare your two uh, death scenes? Is this one better than the the one from season one, or what appeared like a death scene at the time? 
I love the death in season one more. Is that weird that we're talking about how to <laughs> die? I love dying in season one more than dying in season two. But it was fun. Yeah. I, I like using a machine gun. That was a lot of fun. And then I liked uh, the the beating beating him up and choking him. Right. <laughs> Again, <laughs> anytime you can get the action in. And then also when they were shooting, you know, they shoot and then you're supposed to like go back. So that was interesting, kind of. And then the blood on the glass. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Very stark image. Have you ever had right. that happen to you? Where you can't say that I have. No. Although, again, we could demonstrate right now. Yeah. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, quickly run through. Uh, as as you know, the show has um, amazing fan theories behind it on Reddit and other message sure. boards. Sure, I'll answer so I, all of them. I run. I want to ask a few uh, fan theories your way, and sort of yeah. Clementine specific. Okay. So there are some people who think fan theory number one. Uh, Clementine took Bernard to Elsie specifically because she has residual affection for Elsie from season one, and that's the reason why she dragged him there. Maybe. Do you think that? I, fans do. I would say they say it on Reddit. But I, I mean, I, I could see, like, again, there are lingering memories sometimes, right? So maybe yeah. there's something there deep in her. Maybe in there's something deep, brain. deep, deep in her unconscious right. that makes her want to take Bernard to Elsie. Yeah. Sure. I, yeah. I buy it. You'll buy that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Another theory. Uh, you can track the different rebellions and time periods by the color of Clementine's belt. That, that's the clue to the different time periods that you're in and all the different host rebellions. By Clementine's belt? Yeah. That's true. Oh, okay. No, I, it's not. <laughs> Breaking I, news. No, 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 no. I like the idea, though. I mean, these thoughts that people put into this. Right. I learn more about the show from them than from working on it. <laughs> because there's so much thought. Like, I, I didn't think about the belt. <laughs> What belt are we talking about here? It's crazy. And then last one. I think this might be my favorite. Um, she, uh, the reason why in season one she'd always tell clients that she'd give them a discount if they washed ahead of time is because that was the park telling the clients to remember to take baths. That they'd, so they'd always be clean. That was sort of programming instilled by the park to remind them, like, take a shower every once in a while, guys. Oh, yeah, I like that. I, uh, maybe also they smell bad. <laughs> And probably she didn't want to have sex with them. <laughs> but that's not all she offered. She offered right. love. You exactly. Know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and she had her own comfort to take care of as well. So, you know, right. you should keep that in mind. All right, well, let's turn it over to the audience. I'm sure we have some questions from these folks. Hey, Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, you touched upon this with the uh, Shakespeare and the, and the ballet, but uh, what kind of research went into this role, like, to get into character? Thank you. That's a great question. So before I started the season, I had done a lot of research in looking at YouTube videos of actual um, androids. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, what makes them not so human? And I would think I would take a tiny bit of what that might have been. So if we're talking like this and I never blink, mm -hmm. or it could be something subtle like that, I was just trying to catch those little things. Besides that, I'd seen the movie. I, I, I yeah. saw the movie, I read the book. And, um, and, then, and then looked into being a prostitute. Like what it takes to be a prostitute. Because <laughs> it was just Makes like, sense. yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Another question? Uh, I was wondering, um, given the depth and the complexities of the storylines and the characters, as an actress and you're acting out a scene, do you prefer to be in the dark about what happens to Clem, or would you rather just act out kind of the moment and what you think the scene calls for? Well, it was interesting. I've always worked in a way where I know all the information yeah. on whatever it might be. So I would think having all that information might inform what I do now and then what might happen later. Right. But I found with the show that it's an interesting way to direct your actors yeah. by giving them just the right amount of information that they may need. And actually, my imagination grew in that way. Mm -hmm. So I could play so many different things and kind of live in this moment and then say, oh, now we're going here. Okay, now that's what's happening. So it was, I, I kind of liked staying in the dark. And to, to that effect, I am not, have not seen any of the episodes right. similar to you guys. I'm watching them with you because I think that is awesome. Like, mm. it's kind of cool that you're watching it. I'm watching it. You're going, what? I'm going, what? And, and, and it's like a cathartic thing. Like, everybody is watching Westworld at the same yeah. time. So I thought, because they, they'd send me a few of the episodes, which was so generous. But 
I thought, I don't want to see it on my laptop. I'll see it in real time. So cool. I like staying in the dark yeah. sometimes. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. And another question? Hey, Angela. Hey. I'm um, just touching back on fan theories again. So I heard um, Terry George, the filmmaker, is a huge fan yeah. of the show, and you worked with him in The Promise. Yes. And I, I heard that he um, made some predictions from season one that came true. So um, about somebody being a, a host. I don't, yes, want, to, I don't yeah. want to spoil it for anybody. So the question I have, um, what was it like working for Terry Jones? Because he's an amazing director and writer. Yeah. And uh, secondly, did he give you any more predictions that have come true? Yes, he's always right, too. Um, I don't know how he knew, um, but Terry knew that Bernard was a host after seeing the pilot. And I thought, I don't even think Jeffrey Wright knew that he was a host until shooting season one. Um, so that was, that was what, what happened. Working with Terry, had, it, was, it was really special because um, he could say something very simple like, when you're talking to him, just look down. And by looking down, it changes the entire scene. Um, so I thought he was such a, a very sensitive person and director, and I, I really enjoyed working on that film. Specifically, that film is about the Armenian genocide, and I'm Armenian. So it was incredibly uh, intimate, and uh, it's kind of like each day, each moment was at a different level for me personally because it was kind of like my ancestors' stories. And I, I thought he did a beautiful job with the film. And he also predicted something else about season two. And he was right, and I can't remember what it was, but I remember he said, and this is what happens. And I went, and I was lying. I was like, nope, that's not true. But he was right. He, and I can't remember what it was, though. Well, I didn't tell you, but he came up with the belt theory. That was the, the, that was Terry's. He submitted that to me. Did no. he? <laughs> oh. I was like, no, that can't be right. Maybe he did. But maybe. I, I like but the maybe. I think we should ask him and see we what he We should ask thinks. him. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in today. Make sure to tune Thank in you. to Westworld Thank Sunday you. nights. Thanks to Angela Serafian. And uh, let's all root for a Westworld musical episode sometime soon. Yes, and I'll be that, the right? star of the musical <laughs> exactly. episode. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.